The topic we're going to focus on is what is metaphysics? Now, a simple view of metaphysics is that it's just about reality. It's the study of reality. Is that fair enough? Almost. It's the philosophical study of reality. Of course, many disciplines study reality. Metaphysics is the philosophical study of reality. And of course, reality is a big thing. You might think of it as including everything. So metaphysics this is the study of the most general features of reality. Well, so how does that differ from science? Because for many people, science is the best way we have for discovering anything about the nature of reality, whether it be the size of a planet or the nature of a microorganism. The main difference from science is that the philosophical study of reality is a priori. That means that it's independent of observation. So whereas the scientist will work in the laboratory or rely on the results that issue from the laboratory, the philosopher will not be so heavily dependent on such results. He'll just sit in his armchair or her armchair and think about the nature of reality. The kinds of questions they'll consider will be the nature of space and time, the nature of causation, what is a person, and so on and so forth. So these just very general questions about what you might call the fabric of reality. But if you're just speculating from your armchair, how could you possibly know that you were right, for instance, about the nature of time or space and time? It seems to me that you want to get out of the armchair and find out about things in the world if you're investigating reality. Well, this is a fundamental question facing the study of metaphysics. To what extent is it possible to gain a priori knowledge of the general nature of reality? However, there do seem to be questions of great interest that can only be answered by a priori means. Well, let's take the question of the nature of cause. Hume thought that causation was just a matter of regularities. What it was for one thing to cause another is for the one thing or things of that type to be followed by things of the other type. Other people have thought, well, no, there must be more, there must be some kind of necessary connection. The one thing, in some real sense, must make the other thing happen. There are no real experimental methods that would, could settle that question. At least it's, on the face of it, there don't appear to be. So if we are to have any hope of settling the question, it would just seem to be that we could only do it by thinking about it in the armchair. So to take Hume's example, one billiard ball rolls against another one, there's a click, the second ball moves, the first one causes the second one to move. Many people would think if you want to understand cause and effect, what you have to do is investigate the nature of that collision scientifically. Why is it a philosophical problem in the a priori way you described so the actual detailed mechanism of the cause and effect of how one billiard ball hitting the other would impact on the other is a scientific matter, of course. But the question now is this, if you do want to say, and maybe you don't, but if you do want to say that the first billiard ball hitting the second causes the second to move, then the question is, well, what is the nature of that causal relationship between the one event and the other? We're not interested in the actual details here of how fast the one would move, given that it's hit by the other or what have you. And then there's a big divide here. Some people think that all we have in the universe is just one thing following another. So if there is causation here, it just must be a matter of this particular event following the other particular event and similar events following from similar events. As I say, other people have thought causation cannot just be a matter of one thing following another. There must be some kind of necessary connection in the world. Somehow it must be necessary if the one event happened that the other happened, if there's to be a genuine causation. That very general question about the nature of causation is not one that it seems science can answer. Given this isn't an empirical question, you've got these two candidate explanations or descriptions of cause and effect and how they're related. How do you discriminate between them? So if you're a Humean, or what's sometimes called a regularity theorist, you have to try to distinguish between so-called accidental generalizations, generalizations where one thing just happens to follow another, from genuine causal generalizations. So it may well be, for example, that at 5 to 12, some people leave a classroom in what school? And at 12, some other children leave a classroom. But there's no causal connection between the two. So this is a purely accidental generalization. The one happens to follow the other. If someone is a Humean, they have to try to account as best they can for that distinction between accidental generalizations and the causal generalizations. On the other hand, the non-Humeans have to give an account of what this necessary connection might be, say how it can do the kind of work that we want it to do, and so on and so forth. We can adjudicate the question in terms of how adequate these answers are. 
So in your example, with the school children, one group leaving at 5 to 12 and the other leaving at 12, this always seems to happen whenever one group leaves, five minutes later the other one does, but there's probably no causal connection between those, yet it looks like there could be because there is this pattern of regularity. Now what you're saying there presumably is that that's merely an accidental coincidence. The thing we're trying to investigate when we're looking at cause and effect is something which isn't accidental, which seems to be a necessary connection. Right. So there's certain things that generalizations are just accidentally true. One thing just happens to follow another, but not for a causal reason. And there are others that seem to happen for a causal reason. So if you have a regularity view, according to which causation is a matter of one thing following another, you have to distinguish between the accidental cases of one thing following another and the genuinely causal cases. The question is whether there are enough resources within the regularity theory to make the kind of distinctions we think actually exist. So let's take another example of a metaphysical question. You mentioned the nature of a, of a person. Mm-hmm. How could that be a metaphysical question? Superficially, it seems almost like a psychological question. Yes, so we're asking what is a person, and if you like, what is a person by his or her very nature? Perhaps we can get a, a feel for the question by considering some of the answers that might be given. You might think a person is simply his or her body, or you might think that a person has something like a soul, so the person is a soul. Or you might think a person is some combination of a soul and a body. Or you might have a view according to which there's no more to a person than his or her experiences. So these are all very different views about the nature of a person. A person as such, if you like. Not the nature of a person's psychology or personality or what have you. So again, this is operating at a very general level. And that seems to be a characteristic of metaphysics that it's not the kind of very specific investigation of a particular individual but more like the question what is an individual what is a person what is cause what is free will those are all big metaphysical questions yes so there's a great deal of generality in the question so we're not interested in the nature of men as opposed to women for example that wouldn't be general enough We're also interested in the nature of these things in themselves. That is at the most abstract level, abstracting from the very particular features they might just happen to have. A further example of metaphysics is the question, what is a number? What are the candidates there? A number of candidates. Some people have just thought of numbers as the same as the signs for numbers, the so-called numerals. Other people have thought that numbers are something abstract in some sort of platonic realm existing independently of us. Other people have thought the numbers are some kind of mental construction, perhaps somewhat like a fictional object that's made up by the mathematician in the way that a fictional character is made up by an author. So these are three views, but there are many, many others as well. It seems in a way that the mathematician is doing something quite close to what a metaphysician might be doing. They're thinking about abstract entities, reasoning in a way that doesn't necessarily relate back to actual individuals. Often mathematicians are thinking about the nature of an equation or trying to find some kind of entity which doesn't seem to have any direct connection with the real world as we experience it. Well yes, mathematics is like metaphysics in being an a priori investigation into reality. One of the reasons one might have for thinking metaphysics is possible is that mathematics is possible. I should mention that mathematics is an a priori study of reality. I'm not sure it's the a priori study of the nature of reality. The mathematicians are not interested as such in the nature of numbers or what have you. They're interested in numbers. And I think that mathematics doesn't have the generality of metaphysics. So mathematics is interested in a very specific subject matter. Now, there's a great tradition of metaphysics from the ancient Greeks onwards, from the pre-Socratics onwards. But in the 20th century, it came under radical attack, particularly from the logical positivist movement. Yes, it did. And it's only recently, actually, that philosophers recovered from those attacks. They were taken very seriously and for a very long time. Uh, Many philosophers, as a result of those attacks, just dismissed metaphysics as so much idle talk. So let's just run the sort of argument that A.J. Ayer popularised in Language, Truth and Logic against metaphysics. He said, for anything to be a meaningful statement, it has to either be true by definition, like all cats are animals, or else it's got to be empirically verifiable in the sense that you could do some kind of scientific experiment to show that the statement that you made was true or false. And anything that didn't pass that two-pronged test for meaningfulness ended up in the category of meaningless statements, which he pejoratively labelled metaphysics. Yes, that's true. He did make that attack, and Humer made a similar attack before him. And behind that attack is a very serious question, which is the question you started out with, which is how can philosophers hope from their armchair to discover anything about the nature of the world? Given this quite vigorous 
a sort of metaphysics as traditionally conceived. How did it recover? You said it recovered and that in recent years it's been flourishing. How could it possibly recover from that attack? I guess there are two things. One is just the kind of intellectual argument that you might give, what you think is wrong with with Ayer's attack. And there were many criticisms of Ayer. I'm not sure that many philosophers actually subscribe a decade or two after the positivists' attacks to the so-called verification criterion of meaning. But still, it wasn't clear that there was a viable enterprise of doing metaphysics. Part of the reason had nothing to do with the positivist attacks, but just the quality of metaphysical discussion. It just seemed to be very obscurantist. So even if the positive subjections weren't correct in principle, they did seem to point to something that was wrong in the discipline itself. Metaphysics often involves very difficult concepts, and one might wonder whether these concepts have any real application. So metaphysicians, for example, claim to be talking about the fundamental nature of reality, but what's this notion of fundamentality or reality? And another difficulty is that metaphysicians often seem to be just disputing what's a matter of common sense. They might say, look, everything's mental or everything's physical, and this just seems to fly in the face of common sense. So there are a number of things that made metaphysics seem very suspicious. And what's happened is that slowly philosophers, I think, realised that the questions of metaphysics were real questions and were worth studying. I can imagine a a sceptical listener here who's saying to himself or herself, this is all very interesting for you and your colleagues, but why should any university be funded to have such people? Why do metaphysicians exist at all, given scarce resources? For one thing, I think these questions are of interest in themselves. I think there can be hardly a person who has not thought about the nature of mind or the nature of physical reality and how the two might relate. But also these very general concepts are employed or are presupposed in many other disciplines. And so by being clearer about these concepts through metaphysics, we can be clear about their role in these other disciplines. For example, the notion of cause is pervasive throughout many different subjects. And we talk about cause in many different ways, in the social sciences and the physical sciences and what have you. And so one might hope that the general study of these concepts could actually be of real benefit to these other disciplines. I wonder if there's one single discovery or theory in the whole history of metaphysics that you think encapsulates what can be achieved with metaphysics. Maybe a good example is the distinction between primary and secondary qualities, which had a huge impact on on science. So the, the thought was that the primary qualities were somehow real in the objects themselves. So the primary qualities would be things like length or mass or what have you, and the secondary qualities would be things like colour or taste and what have you. And it was thought that the secondary qualities were reflections of the human mind, how we reacted to the primary qualities. That distinction suggests that science should be thinking about the primary qualities rather than the secondary qualities, because insofar as they were interested in the physical world in itself rather than our reaction to it, then that's what this distinction would suggest. Making that distinction had a huge impact, it seems to me, on the study of, of science.